Hello, everyone. Welcome to a live dev mentoring session. In those sessions, we help students of the iOS Lead Essentials program solve any technical challenges they are facing. Today, we are helping our student Balas. Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining us live again. All right. So this is the second session. And this time you chose the topic, how to create a generic networking layer in iOS apps, specifically with Combine, correct? Yes. Okay. Can you explain a little bit your challenge, how to create a networking layer with Combine? Walk us through. Yeah, I, I want to implement uh, a login and uh, network layering with uh, Combine. So I want to use uh, uh, access token and refresh token. And uh, I, I want to use uh, Combine with, uh, with that. So I want to refresh the, the access token with the refresh token if I need to. And if uh, the refresh token expired, I, I want to show the login screen again to the users. So th that's the okay. ordinary login. Show login screen. And the token can be validated at any point, right? In the application, like yes. it could be in any navigation state from anywhere. Yeah. And it's Swift UI? It, yes, it's Swift UI. And I don't want to uh, handle the error in uh, every uh, view model. So I want to uh, composition route. So. By duplication, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so authorization is a cross cutting concern, which means like many parts of your application will require authentication. And you don't want to duplicate this logic everywhere in your app, right? You don't want to have like every service, every view model having to deal with tokens and uh, having to deal with invalid tokens and refresh tokens and so on. So we need to find a solution that avoids duplication. Okay. Any specific reason why you want to use Combine? Uh, because the the whole project uses Combine and uh, and I want to learn that uh, framework also. Okay, is this a project you created or you inherited this project? I inherited this project, so I need mm -hmm. to learn it. Okay, so you inherited a project using Combine and you're not very familiar with Combine yet. You're learning yeah. it, okay. Yes. Cool. First of all, walk us through the app here. We have a yeah. simple, this is a demo app. It's not the actual project you're working on, right? It's just like yeah. a subset yes. of yeah. features. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Focusing the yeah. login, login system and the network player, yes. So it's the app is full of Swift UI. Do you have any UI kits yeah, there? Absolutely. Or? Yeah, no. okay. okay. So this is the root application and it has some app logging state. It's a state object, so every time it changes, the UI will be uh, updated, right? Right. And depending on the logging state, you show either a logging view if it's not authorized. Yes. Or if it is authorized, you show the, the normal app flow, I guess. Yeah. With the logged in user. That's the empty view, uh, uh, almost empty view, just uh, uh, because I have got uh, another uh, functions in the normal application. So I'm just okay. don't use Yeah. So there's a bunch of functionality simple. here depending on the yeah. token state. And the point is, if the login state changes, you need to update your user interface to do something yeah. else. Log in okay. or, or use the, the whole application state like uh, logged in yeah okay cool and i see there are no tests the no. real project also has no tests yes i, I want to also uh, implement tests okay yeah i highly recommend you add tests as we teach there in the program because your life will be much easier with good tests yeah, it will be much easier to yeah. change code without breaking functionality, right? Right. 
but we won't be covering testing here. We can talk about it, but we won't cover this in this session because we already have many lectures and mentoring sessions about it. Okay. Including how to test with combine, RX Swift, async await, and so on. Like we have <laughs> covered this extensively. So when you start adding tests, which I highly recommend you do, you should check out those sessions. Okay. Another thing about combine is that I like to limit combine to certain parts of my app. I understand that you inherited this project, so it's using combine everywhere, so you don't have a choice right now. <laughs> but as you, you learn in the program, we don't want our whole app to coupled with a specific framework because we want to be able to switch to other frameworks easily. Yeah. You no, know, for example, before Combine existed, a lot of people coupled their apps with RX Swift. Then Apple introduced Combine, which could provide the same features with a built-in framework, but they could not migrate easily because they were too coupled with RX Swift, so they couldn't switch to Combine easily. So their apps, the builds are slower because they need to build RX Swift every time along with the app, and their app binaries are also larger because they include the whole RX Swift framework in every build. So there is a benefit of decoupling as much as possible from frameworks. So you can easily switch between frameworks, right? And we can say that, okay, but Combine is an Apple framework. We don't need to decouple from it. And maybe that's true. But then Apple comes and introduces a sync await. And you're like, I want to use a sync await. Yeah. Like, I cannot because my whole app is using <laughs> Combine. So we're always like in this catch up phase, always behind when we're using frameworks everywhere. We become too coupled. It's too rigid. It's hard to you know, detach from them. So just an advice, if you can, little by little, start decoupling a little bit combine from your app. It may make it easier to then introduce async await at some point in your app, right? Because mm -hmm. async await plays well with Swift UI as well, with the new task uh, modifiers and so on. And if you want to use async await, it will be hard if you're using combine everywhere. So that's why we limit the usage of frameworks and we teach in the program how to limit the usage of frameworks in your app because it keeps your options open. You know, you can always change your mind. Oh, I'm using Alamo Fire, but now there's a new one. I'm going to use this new one because it's better, it's faster, it's smaller, you know, whatever makes sense to your application. Keeping your options open is important. And we teach in the program how to use Combine. Still take advantage of it because it's a good framework. Right? Combine is a good framework and you can do great things with it. But we still teach how to take advantage of it while you're still keeping most of the application decoupled from it. So yeah. if you need to change it in the future, it's very easy to do. Only a small part of the app depends on it, usually the infrastructure layer. So you just need to update the infrastructure. The same with RxWift, Swift, async await, yeah. You uh, wrote a extension for uh, the HTTP client class for in the sessions? Yes. For yes. the publishers soon? Yes. And we use the combined framework just to compose some yeah. operations because it's pretty nice to, you know, compose some unrelated operations with publishers. Yeah. So we use it where it's going to give the most benefit and we avoid depending too much on it. So we are free and open to use other things when needed. Okay, so this is just some advice. If you can start decoupling some parts of your app from Combine, that might be best. If you use it everywhere, you'll be too coupled with it to later decide to <laughs> use something else. It's good to keep options open. Okay. All right. And do you have this functionality working with access tokens, refresh tokens, or you need to implement it? Uh, I think it's working uh, well, but uh, if you can see it, uh, I would be very happy. We have a network manager, perform authenticated request. That's where it gets the token, right? And uh, yes, from the signs the request with the token. Okay, and if there is an error, yes, I have got a custom error. Refresh. Yeah. Okay. So he tries to get uh, an existing token in the app and sign a request. Try to make the request. If he fails, 
you will try to refresh the token and try the request yes. again. Is that it? Yes. Yeah. Try the request again. OK. So this is working. We don't have a problem with it, right? Yes. OK. And I see you have a session. What is this session? URL session, network session. So this is pretty much your HTTP client, right? That makes the requests. Yeah. And you created a protocol. So you have a point here which allows testability, right? You can test without actually making network requests because you can create a fake network session, for example, for testing. Yes. So if you want to start adding tests, you already have the things in place for it. But I also add the token uh, parameter for that. So I think it will be need delete it and uh, use decorate or something. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, because there's a problem here is that this network session is doing too many things. You can see that it makes the request, then it decodes the request, and also needs to sign the request. So like, the number of parameters already tells like some kind of different kinds of responsibilities this class must have, right? It needs to perform the request, decode the response, and also sign the request if provided a token, yeah. right? Because it's optional. So we can see the implementation here. If there is a token, it signs the request, add the token to the header. And then when there is a response, it needs to validate the response and then check the status code and then try to decode the response. It's doing a lot of things, right? And it, it looks not, it's not a lot of lines of code because combine is pretty neat with like composing things, but there's a lot of things going on here in one single place, right? And you may start having issues with that. So let's let's see what we can do here. So what we're using URL session, that's nice. You know, the foundation type available as a system framework. You don't need any extra dependencies. I like that. It's very common to see using Alamo Fire or some like more complex frameworks for performing requests when usually URL session is all you need. It's already there in the framework. You don't need any extra dependency. Now the problem is that URL session can perform not just HTTP requests, but also FTP, web sockets, file system requests to load URLs in the file system. So it returns a URL response, right? But what you want is HTTP URL response. So I like to usually create HTTP client abstraction. which doesn't need to force it to be an, an, an object. There's a reason to force it to be in any object. Could be a struct, the implementation, why not? And my HTTP client, I don't want to couple it with too many responsibilities, like decoding and tokens. I just want it to make HTTP requests. As simple as that, it makes HTTP requests. So it doesn't need the code. The code is responsibility of someone else. Assigning the request is responsibility of someone else. All I want is a class that can make HTTP requests. And the result of the request should be data and an HTTP URL response or number. That's how I like to create my generic HP clients. You perform the request. Because sometimes uh, I use a custom uh, error class because uh, sometimes if you have got a, a 401 uh, status yeah. code, there is a error in the body. So yeah. sometimes I need to decode to that. Yeah, you can still use your custom uh, error types because they all conform to the error protocol, right? So this is an open error protocol because this HTTP client, it may fail for many reasons. Right now you have this API error handler that is 
an error for a specific API you're talking to, right? But what if you're talking to more than one API request? Now we're going to need another HTTP client uh, abstraction because it's very I it's see. very rare that your app will talk with only one API request, right? And every API has their own, you know, custom logic, their own kind of. All you're going to have on Enum ever uh, with many many cases for all kinds of APIs you have here, which is also a problem. Or you define an HP client that is, has, it only throws an error, any error. And dealing with errors is not part of the HP client, yeah. right? HP client just makes a request. The error here, if there's an error, it's because something went wrong with the connection. And we're gonna build the functionality of talking to an API on top of this HP client. Yeah. Like we're gonna have to decode this data. We're gonna have to check the URL response status code. But this logic here is specific to APIs and also specific to endpoints. Even within the same API, different endpoints may have different requirements. One endpoint may return uh, 204, which is empty response with no data, but it's still valid. But if every response here is trying to be decoded with a JSON decoder, you cannot decode an empty data. It will, even though it's a valid response, 204 with no body, this will crash. Not crash, it will fail because it cannot decode an empty data into JSON. Right? So like, I don't like to have logic in my HTTP client, in the network session here, because this is, every endpoint may have a custom requirement. Yeah. Right? So I want to, to have a point of customization at least, because this may work right now, but then tomorrow you need to make another API request that has this custom logic. You're gonna to have to have another if URL uh, request dot URL equals something and status code equals 204, do something else. This is a magnet of logic you're gonna yeah. start adding here in your client because some endpoints or some specific APIs may require custom logic. That's why I don't want to have logic in my clients. I want my clients to just make the request. The logic will be somewhere else that is very easy to test. Yeah. You cannot blame the backend, you know, like, oh, the standard says this, you know, like you should return this or you should return that. No, like you need to be able to, to be flexible enough, basically, you know, to accommodate any sort of uh, convention the backend uses. You know, that's why it's a generic thing that we're building here, right? Because then you, you can use this HTTP client not only with one API, with any API, right? It just makes yes. requests. Who creates the request? Someone needs to create the request and sign it. Someone else needs to, to map the data into some objects. But that's not the client responsibility. It's not the URL session responsibility. So that's usually how I create an HTTP client, as simple as that. And we can even make an extension if you want as well of the URL session implementing the client. And what does it need to do here? Implement the publisher method. And it makes a request. needs to convert it to HTTP URL response. Otherwise, it throws a failure. If it works, it returns the result data and the mapped response here. We're casting. Yeah. I also, this is an API error handler for a specific API. And if this client will be used for any API, we want it to be generic. Uh, I would create its own error here. Like invalid HTTP response error. Error. I want anything specific to APIs or endpoints in my client because it should be able to make requests to any API to any endpoint. And we erase. any publisher. 
It will be an implementation, a simple implementation of the protocol we just created. Just so we don't need to be doing this conversion all the time, you can reuse this logic. Every time we want to make a request, use the HP client. That's it. Now, who creates the request? Who signs the request? Someone else. Who converts data into your models? Someone else. The client only makes HTTP, HTTP requests. That's its responsibility. Rather than doing everything, it's more open to have something that does one thing and that can be reused in different contexts. This can only be used in specific contexts. This can be used in any context. That's we should be request. Reviewed. Yes. Does it make sense so far? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now, this HP client, uh, it doesn't need to use combine, right? If you say, I don't want to use combine, it could be using closures, a completion closure, or async await. Yeah. Like this. Right? It doesn't need to use combine. It's just showing that you can have an abstraction HP client that uses async await. But if you need to use combine for whatever reason, we can use combine as well. I also prefer the closures. Uh, to use it. Yeah, you prefer closures, closures? but yeah, closures. Uh, but uh, in this uh, scenario, I need to use combine for the whole application. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this is a boundary, right? Like, um, that's something to consider, I believe, that, like, <laughs> generally, you don't want to tie your boundaries, you know, tie them down with a specific, uh, you know, framework, third-party dependency and stuff like that. You want them to be flexible. So you can, for example, here, you can easily choose closures, you know, for the callback and then wrap it, uh, whatever, you know, the client of the protocol uh, wrap it there, you know, um, with combine or something, you know, similar or just a single way, you know, whatever, like a built-in feature in the language. Yeah, you can define the main protocol with just closures and then you can have extensions that expose the same interface to combine or even a single weight. Yeah. Right? You can transform on we have a session as well showing how to get closure-based APIs and make them into async await without breaking clients by adding async await on top of that as well. So options, right? Depending on what you want to achieve, you can use different solutions. The idea is to have an HP client that is not specific to any endpoint. You can make any HP requests to any endpoint to any API. So it has a URL request, data, HP URL response and error. They are all foundation types. URL request is defining the foundation framework. Data is defining foundation. HP URL request is foundation type. So no external dependencies here. Only combine, but if you want to depend, not depend on combine, you can use closures or async await as well. So this is the HP client. Now we still need to do the decoding and deal with tokens, right? Yes. So we need to be able to sign the requests and refresh the tokens. So we could have now a decorator that you, you mentioned that we show in the program. You can decorate this HP client or any HP client implementation and add the signing on top of it. For example, you can create an authenticated HP client the creator that implements the HP client and also adds an HP client because that's the decorator pattern. It's a type that implements an abstraction and also has the instance that will be decorated inside of it. And here, let's say we want to sign the request so we can have the token as well as a dependency. This is an all GWT token, right? Yes. Create initializer and 
implement our publisher method because it's a requirement of the HP client protocol. And here we can get this signed request logic. This signed request. Now we don't even need to check the token yeah, so exists sure. or not because we do have a token, right? It's not optional anymore. If I need to sign the request, I need to have a token. Something like this. So the responsibility we are adding with the decorator, you add behavior to an existing instance without having to subclass it, without having to change its code. How? By implementing the same abstraction and delegating the messages now to the client. So we call the client make the request, but now it's a signed request. So we added the signing to the chain. So we return the publisher that signs the, that performs the request. So we added this behavior and we can pass any client here. For example, it could be, we can pass here the URL session, right? It conforms to the it's a big client. protocol. Yeah. We can pass any instance here and add this behavior to it in the request and then you can decide when you're creating your services does the service needs authenticated requests or not like a login service when you're logging in it doesn't need the token right because you're actually requesting the token you're doing the all off dance yeah and in this case you don't need an off client so you just pass a normal client but other parts of the application may require a logged in user and it will pass an authenticated HP client because it needs to be authenticated right so this is how you would sign the request. And let's say the token varies or it needs to be refreshed. So having a uh, reference to a token, as soon as it's invalidated, what can you do? You cannot just replace this static uh, constant here. Not static, constant token. So if the token varies, it needs to be refreshed or so on. We can create something like a token provider, which is what you have here, right? You have an authenticator somewhere that does the logic. Yeah. It keeps the current it's a little token, bit mixed, see if it's mixed. valid. Doesn't need to be refreshed. Yeah. yeah. So if the token varies, you cannot just have a constant token. We could have a token provider like you created there token provider and since you're using combine it could be something like token publisher in publisher that should emit either a jwt token or an error because it can fail right maybe the refresh failed maybe the token is not valid anymore Now to make a request is not as simple as just signing it, but you can get the token provider, publisher, you can map token. Map is gonna be called when there is a successful token and you can sign a request with the token and return the signed request. Then you can set map to your client publisher and simplify it into this. Yeah. And of course, we need to erase any publisher. So we're adding this behavior of signing the request to any client. But the client doesn't know about signing, right? The whole abstraction here doesn't know about signing, doesn't know about mapping or anything. It just performs requests. If you need this extra functionality to it, we can create a decorator that authenticates the request. And then you decorate only in parts of the application that needs the authentication. Not every part needs authentication. No, we may have a guest 
account that doesn't require authentication, then you can just pass any HTTP client that doesn't require authentication. In places where you need authentication, you pass an authenticated yeah. client. So it adds this functionality of signing the request to the client, to any client. Because remember, authentication is a cross-cutting concern. Many different parts of the app need it. And the creators are a good place to add cross-cutting concerns. We can centralize this reusable logic while hiding it from clients. So doesn't matter how deep you are in your application, in the view hierarchy, you still be dealing at some point with an HTTP client that will be signing the request. And you will share the same instance to make sure that they all use the same token provider. So if there's any change in the token state, you can notify the, the user interface, for example, that something changed. So it's good to centralize the token provider here in the HP client of the creator. So we don't need to inject this token provider everywhere. Because imagine if we need to sign requests and we keep injecting this token provider in every view model, in every service, you're going to duplicate logic. Yeah. But if we keep it in the creator here, no one even knows that there is this authentication going on behind the scenes. It's all hidden. Still it happens, but we hide this complexity from everywhere in the app. And also your app may connect with different APIs, with different authentication flows. Not every API may require a GWT token. Some other APIs may require username and password or different yeah. ways of authentication. And you can create different decorators for each API. We still use the same HTTP client and it's decorated differently for different APIs that have different requirements. And you hide all this complexity, these cross cutting concerns from the rest of your application. The token provider will deal with the refresh token logic. You already have the implementation for it. So when someone requests the token, it will check. Is the token still valid? Because there's an expiration there. No, it's older than the expiration. OK, I'm going to make a request to make a token. And if it fails, it throws an error. Otherwise, it returns a token and you make the request. Now, in case the user token is invalid, which is one of the requirements here, you want to show a login screen from anywhere in the app. Yeah. Since the logic is centralized here for the token, you could do it here. For example, you can say handle events, receive completion. So we completed. Mm -hmm. uh, closure. Receive a completion, and you need to check: did it complete successfully or with an error? So, if case let, what's the type of this completion here? Subscriber completion error. So, if you completed with a failure, with an error. And this error is, how, how do you do it? Token expired, is this the name? Token expired, yes. If you complete it with this specific error. Yes, but the token expired is for the access token, not the refresh token. So I, I need one more uh, scenario. Ah, okay, yes. Because, so because token expired can, uh, should only trigger a refresh. But if the yes. refresh is still invalid, because like that's it, J JWT tokens or any tokens, they can be invalidated for any reason. If the backend thinks there is a threat, they would invalidate your token. So your refresh yes. token is not good anymore, right? So you will need some yes. kind of unauthorized, something like this, to handle that case. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to add it here because it, it will have some Errors. But we could check here if the error case API error handler dot unauthorized. For now, let's just say token expired because you don't have that case yet. Is like this error API error handler. So if the error we received, so if the stream completed with a failure, 
and this error is of type error handler token expired or unauthorized in this in your case we could notify clients through some kind of observer mechanism like it could be a closure like need of <laughs> simple as a closure yeah. So if you got here, let's say you just not fight. There is, there is being a, a failure. Let me capture this closure here, so we can call it. Yes. Let's say if you get to, if you have an error with whatever type you you define as what's going to be thrown when there is a invalid token for that specific API, you call this callback here. Needs off. And then you can compose a view model, for example, or any kind of view storage with this method. Yeah. So every time this method is called, you update the UI. Let's say there's a view model somewhere or some kind of view state somewhere. You have a published property like login state. We have logged in. We have logged out. Okay. You can have a method like logout. Just set the login state, logout. Whoops. Yeah. No dot here. <laughs> like this. And here's an observable object. This has nothing to do with UI. The HTTP client does not need to confirm to observable object. This can be used in Swift UI. It can be used in AppKit. It can be used in UIKit. It can be used anywhere. I don't try to tailor my HTTP client to serve Swift UI because they are unrelated concerns, right? Making a request and showing the user interface, they are different things. Uh, my problem was that uh, I, I uh, tried to solve it, uh, combine also not the delegate with, with the uh, closure. So the needs house closure, I, I tried to use uh, with some combine and it it wasn't work. So can you show me an alternative for combine or uh, try to let it go and use closure? But I oh, so for example, know here, better. this needs off here. If you're using combine, and if there's a failure and it's a specific error, we call needs off, right? And then when you are composing your application, you will create your client, let's say. Let's say there's a point in your app where you compose things and you create your client. It's going to be on the decorator, and there will be a client here. It could be, I don't know, your session shared token provider, you have your authenticator, and you will have some view state, it can be this class, and you will set like the view state, and dot it's off closure equals the view state logout. So even though the view state has no idea about the clients and decorators and all of that, and the client doesn't know about the view, we are composing them because logout is a function void, void exactly what this closure is, right? That's okay. Yeah. So we can compose them. So every time the client calls this function, it will update the state and the view will be observing this state. And it's going to go to logout, and your app will go to the logout phase here, which should show the login screen. And that's how you compose them. So they don't need to know about each other. They don't even need combine to, to make this. It can be a simple closure. You can also do it in combine. Instead of a closure, it could be a pass through subject, for example. That, that was my you question. Emit. Yeah. You can do everything combined if you want. <laughs> Or it could be a just little a bit I think, I, yeah, yeah to, to, 
too too strict to use uh, just combine for everywhere now. Yeah, it's an option. It can also be a pass through subject if you want. It could be something like this. Yeah. It's off, pass through subject, or void. And it never fails, so the error is never. Right? So we had a closure, void to void, and you have a pass through subject that sends void. And here you would just say it's off dot send void. And here I you compose it's subscribe. off dot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you need to subscribe here in the composition, which will be, I don't know, handle, handle events. And receive output. You just pass this, something like this. Every time there is an output, which is void, so you can ignore it. You call the method logout. The same so thing. I don't have to use promise or something in in that. The promise. This is all you need here. Yeah, well, you're yeah. gonna have to hold a reference to the. This returns what it returns a. How do you call it a cancelable, right? That you need to yes. hold. Otherwise, the the whole operation will be discarded. That's why probably if you use a closure, it will be simpler. Can we show in the program how to do it if yeah. you don't want to use a... However, right, you don't want to keep a reference to the cancelable, it can also be done. We show that in the program. I'm not going to remember the syntax right now, but it's possible. Closure is much simpler, it does the same. point is having the client decouple from view, view decouple from the client, but they can still communicate through some kind of observation, either a closure callback, a pass through subject here, combine, publisher, whatever makes sense, whatever you prefer. There are different ways to compose them. And of course, you're going to pass this view state down the Swift UI hierarchy so the UI can observe state changes to the view state, just like you have here. It could be here, your view state. Every time it changes, it's a state object or an observed object, whatever makes sense. Every time it emits a change, the UI is redrawn with the new state. That's how you will compose the client with the view state. And observable object, everything view related stays in the view side of things. Your client doesn't need to know about it. And everything related to HP clients stays on the API infrastructure layer. So the view doesn't need to know about it. But they still communicate through this observation here. you will have some services that will use the HP client. For example, yes. what kind of services do you have here? Instructors. Yeah, maybe a language country service is uh, easier. OK. What does it do? Yeah, get language data. Okay. Let's say I want to get all the countries, a country list, OK? Yeah. So we can create kind of uh, country list service, and it will need an HP client. Maybe decor maybe the decorated uh, HTTP client because it needs uh, it needs to uh, GVT token. Oh, okay, so to get a country list, you need to have a token yes now we could set this type here to force compile time that you need to pass an authenticated one but then we are exposing a bunch of details that we don't need we can also just say HP client and decide in the composition which one we're going to pass exactly that's the idea here because it, it implements the same interface right so we 
don't need to expose like yeah concrete types which allows us to decorate it even more and more with more yeah. functionality if needed right if we set the concrete type here that's it that's all you get you cannot do anything else with it maybe you want to add logging functionality i want to log like how long the requests are taken you know and then we can add a login decorator on top of the authenticated decorator and you can add more cross cutting concerns but if you're using a concrete type you limit that extensibility right yeah it's a choice like both work depending like if you want to enforce a specific type you use the concrete type if you want to leave it open you use the interface all right so the country service will need let's say well utilizer first and let's say it has like load all countries method and since we're using combine everywhere it gets a list of country dto yeah or it can fail right these requests can fail every network request can fail so it now here is logic specific to this endpoint the country list endpoint in the service so loading all countries I, let's say yeah. i have got uh, enough for uh, creating the request so okay how do we create the request uh country in language country provider language country provider yeah get and countries let's get countries yeah make request make request awesome okay so this service knows which endpoint is talking to and it knows how to map the response as well so here we do the mapping logic that let's say we're going to try map into let's say country list mapper right here it's just a static function so the publisher that's data and request it passes get data requests and expects a mapped entity out of it and of course the mapping can fail so you can throw Whoop, throws that's why I try map because it may fail to return a list of country details so data response then we erase erase any publisher okay all right does this conform to codable yes great and here is the logic specific to the endpoint the services will use the generic HP client that can make any request and then it needs to at some point convert that data you received into country list mapper into country DTOs a list of country DTOs so each endpoint may have different rules remember we talked about this based on the status code so let's say if it returns if the response status code equals 204 for example we can just return empty Let's say there's a logic. If it returns 204, it's empty. Then if response the status code equals 200, it does something else. You know, when you check the API documentation, they usually have like different status code and what kind of responses you can expect from them. And you may have to do different logic for it. Instead of always treating them exactly the same. Yeah. we have a point of customization here every service can decide how to handle it so in yes, this but, case we can yes, but, uh, have yeah. i get uh, multiple uh, error handling because uh, every api mapper i have to implement the logic if it's a uh, 403 or something as status code 
and I have to uh, decode the body to the error uh, object. Right, like this, which is yes. here, right? Yeah. This so logic here. That's that's why in the data task publisher uh, mapper. So in now I have to implement multiple times. If I have got a language country service or a instructor service or some any other services. Yeah, so let's say there are some endpoints that have exactly the same logic. When things are exactly the same, we can generalize it and create generic solutions. But you still need to allow some customization points for endpoints that will break that standard. And can be, you can be sure there will be endpoints that will break that standard, either because you're talking to a different API or even within the same API, different endpoints were implemented by different teams, by different developers, yeah. and they didn't follow the standard. And it happens all the time. Right, for example, uh, we were building an app recently and we need to talk to the Slack API. And we talk to an endpoint that if there's a failure, it returns 200. And I need to map the actual response because it would return something like this. Okay, true. If it was actually okay, or it would return okay, false, which is an error. So although it was 200, I had to map the body and check if the value okay was true. If it was false, it was an error, you know, completely out of standard. Yeah. They just decided to yeah. do it like this. So there is no, like, there's no standard everyone is following. Every API have their own standards for whatever reasons. They they have reasons for it. And since they already made these APIs public, it's very hard for them to change because if they change it, they're going to break everyone, all the clients. Yeah. You know, so the longer an API exists, the longer the harder it is to change it. So for legacy reasons, that's how things are. And as a client of this API, you need to deal with it. And this is the kind of problems you have with generic APIs that try to treat every request the same. You always need a point of customization because sadly, there is no agreed standard that everyone follows, even within the same APIs. So we need to account for that when we're creating a solution. So let's say if you need custom logic, you can you have a point of customization. You just use your custom logic here. Oh, uh, so you suggest that uh, I create a general mapper if I have got uh, if I know that uh, the API endpoint will use that. So I don't need to implement every service just every uh, a new mapper for every service just for the different uh, functionality. Yes, you can have a generic HTTP API mapper, which is specific to one API. I've never seen two APIs with following the same standard, even from the same companies. You know, you get like two APIs created by Amazon, and they still look exactly different. <laughs> but let's say for a specific API, let's say generic API one HTTP request mapper, something like this. Some requests follow some standards. They're generic, they can be generalized because they are pretty default in some requests. So then it is logic here you have. Say it is the generic logic, right? Which is the logic you have here. But instead of having them in the client, I will still have it in a generic mapper like this. Let's make it generic. E where he is the codable. Response, response. Like this. Okay, so here we need to map. And you're using this custom date JSON decoder. Dot decode the 
on data. Try because it can fail. So this is a generic one. APIs that follow some convention, this convention here that we have implemented that you have here in the code can we use the same mapper, right? So we can say here, I want to try map using the generic mapper, no problem. Hmm. Compile, it's fine. But you allow a point of customization saying like some services may require some custom logic in which you can implement your own logic and just change it here. Right, so you, you can reuse code where it's possible and where not possible, you still have a point of customization. That's the idea when I'm creating a generic networking layer because unfortunately, there is no perfect API following all the standards. If there was, if everyone was following the same standards and everyone was flawlessly following those standards, we would have like one HP client implementation, probably Apple would implement it and we could just move on with our lives doing something else. But unfortunately, we need to deal with these points of customization yeah, because of inconsistencies. <laughs> yes, it, it is what it is. <laughs> yes. All right. So your app may be using a single API at this moment, but as your app grows, you're going to have to use other services. You're going to have to connect with Slack, with Facebook, with other services, you know, and then you start seeing that the generic logic doesn't work. And if you don't have a point of customization, it will be very hard to bring those new APIs into the app. We're going to have to duplicate code, pretty much. Create a new client, duplicate a bunch of code. But if you keep these options open, then this is all the service does. You know, it makes, it asks the client to make the request, it chooses what is the mapping strategy for it, and that's it. And we need to accommodate these like inconsistencies because they are everywhere. Each API has their own standards. <laughs> And even within their APIs, they don't follow those standards. <laughs> yeah, I mean, otherwise they're gonna make an assumption, you know, or a bunch of them. And how are you gonna deal with the uh, parameterized cases? You know, like you're gonna have to stick a bunch of if else code, you know, it's gonna make uh, things rigid, I think. So yeah, that's the way to go. Yeah, we have a question here that for the mapper, the mapper should only be responsible for mapping the data. Yeah, but the problem is like to map the data, you need to know because depending on the status code, mm -hmm. the mapping yeah. strategy may change. That's the whole point yeah. of it. You know, so you can have the same API and sometimes it returns 204, sometimes 200, sometimes 202. And depending on the status code, the mapping strategy must change. So usually I keep them together. Can you separate them? Yeah, you could do it in the service. The service could handle yeah. the response and use different mappers depending on the yeah. on the status code. That's also a way of doing it. But usually I find it simpler to do it like this. Because yeah. this is for a specific endpoint. It, like it, it encapsulates the logic that the backend shared with you, right? In the docs, this is the, if you go to the docs and say it's 200, it's gonna return this. 201, it's gonna return this. This is the place where you're going to encapsulate that logic, the contract with the backend. Yeah, there are different ways of doing it. Whatever makes sense to your application. Don't be too caught into a specific implementation. The idea is to leave these options open. Yes, the idea is that every service should be able to decide which mapper to use instead of having an HP client that already decides the mapper up front and, and that's it. And you can still have generic implementations that when possible, you use it, you know, reuse it. Also, how simple it is to test this logic because like you want to test this logic, right? Because this is critical logic to make sure you're conforming to the contract with the backend correctly. And you can test this very easily because you don't need to perform network requests. You don't need, to, you can just pass data in a response here. It's very easy to create an HP or a response class with whatever status code you want. And just pass here, whatever status codes you want. Expect something back. <laughs> 
it either should throw an error or should return a list of countries. So you can test what happens with 204, what happens to 200, what happens to 401. It's very easy to unit test the logic without having to make a network request. Also, this is not coupled with combine, which means you can use this with closures, you can use it with combine, you can use this, this mapper with async await. It's not coupled to a specific framework or a specific language feature. It works with all of them. So if you want to refactor later to use async await, you don't need to change anything in the mapper. The logic is intact. It's input the output. backend contract logic is intact. Yeah. You can also create a generic service for endpoints that behave the same. We show in the program as well. How to create a generic service for things that can be generic. Not every endpoint will be able to be generic, but where it can be, you can use their generic implementation because you will see that this is going to happen multiple times. You're going to have a service that has a client and it performs a request and then you need to map to something but that, that can be generalized as well as we showed during the program. So you can reuse code with generic solutions, but the code still needs to be able this needs to be able to be customized, like it needs to be open for extension, right? Because APIs don't follow standards consistently. So our network layers must allow these points of customization. Make sense? Absolutely. And then you, because you extracted the logic from the client. Now to test this logic here, how hard would it be? You would have to create a, get a URL session you would have to pass an authentication token, a request, a decoding type, and then create a subscription to this stream, wait for it to make a request. Probably would have to mock URL protocol to avoid making a request. And to then test the logic you want. But now since you extract the logic, you can just test it directly. So this is going to help with unit test as well. You can test all the mapping logic without a client, which is a good thing. How easy it is to test this function. That's it, static input output. What we want. Yeah, we want to unit test the mapping logic, especially when there are like date conversions currency amounts to make sure there's no rounding errors, you know, this kind of yeah. things. And if you have to go through all these HTTP clients to then test the logic, then it's going to be very hard. Not impossible, but it's going to be harder. But if you can test the logic in isolation, pure functions, input, output, no side effects. Every time you pass the same input, you get the same output. That's a pure function. It doesn't, depire, it doesn't depend on any environment, on any external thing that changes input output and all the complexity the infrastructure is hidden behind the protocol make sense yes so we have an http client infrastructure we have services that can use the http client to make requests we have a way of dealing with authentication of clients implements the of hp client if there it, it sends messages every time there is a change in the authentication so we can compose this with some view state make the view state a different color view state and the view observe the view state with UI view, serves the view state. Every time there's a change in the view state, it re-renders itself. So every time there's a change in authentication from anywhere in the application, it will notify the UI to update because the view state changed. So I think we covered everything using combine. So Access tokens, refresh tokens, using the token provider. Invalid tokens will be notified through the off client. And we will compose that 
with the view state. So we avoid duplication. The view state will be shared. So anywhere in the app, there is a request that returns 401 or whatever makes sense to your app. It will fire the closure that will update the state and update the UI without duplication. And this works with SwiftUI. You can use this whole thing with UI kit, app kit. So this is the composition with SwiftUI, but this could be UI kit as well. This could be a UI kit, view controller, for example, receiving this message. Doesn't matter. Yeah. SwiftUI is not special. It, it works the same. All of these have no idea of the UI framework. And the Which UI it can be reused yeah. in any UI framework. And all of this code has no idea of this logic. This is all composed in the composition root. So there's a layer in between here that decouples them. Position. So you can test this without the UI. You can test this without ATP clients. Just methods. That's the idea. Make sense? Yes. Uh, one, one more question. Uh, if I have got a token provider that uh, use also a network request, so I need to uh, add the HTTP client parameter also. Yes. So let's say you have a token provider here. Token provider, it will have an HTTP client, right? Which is not the authorized one because you, when you're requesting a token, you don't pass the authorization header, right? Or you do it differently with the refresh token. So you would have an HTTP client, but it's not going to be this one. So the off client has a token provider, the token provider has an HTTP client. The service doesn't know about token providers or off clients. This is the protocol, the abstraction. The token provider needs an HTTP client to make requests, to request a token, right? If needed, yeah. And you have already a implementation, yes, right? Authentic authenticator. Authenticator. Does he have a, yeah, he has a session, right? It's the same thing, yeah. just a different interface. Yeah. Instead of doing everything, we just separated it, right? So you can either use the generic mapper for the WT token, or you can have a DWT request mapper that will return a DWT token. Because the token provider is just a service, like any other service, right? It makes a request and maps the JWT token if successful. So a token provider is just another service, nothing special about it. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. And uh, if the whole app is using Combine, it's going to be a big change to get rid of it. <laughs> so yeah. it's yeah. Probably if you have deadlines to keep as is for now and new code you add, maybe you try to decouple it, but like existing code that is working, probably leave it as is. <laughs> so you have a lot of homework to implement the ideas we talked about today. If you get stuck, 
let us know on Slack and we will help you out. Thank you. Awesome. So thank you for joining us again, Balaz. Thank you for great. the opportunity and the help. Thank you. Yeah. Till next time. Till next time. Exactly. Goodbye. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Hello, everyone. How would the networking layer differ on different types of APIs like GraphQL, REST? Well, the difference is that with GraphQL, we probably would use a framework for it, right? You have probably a different abstraction. Yeah. How would you handle cases where closures need to capture self? For example, here we don't need to capture self in any of them. Usually you need to capture self to capture a dependency. For example, needs of is a dependency. It's a property of the decorator and a dependency to run this option, this functionality. And then you capture self here. If you only need a reference to the property, you can capture just the property. For example, you don't need to capture self, but you will hold a reference to the needs of until this closure is released. So it depends on the case. I try to avoid capturing self as much as possible. Can the generic mapper have a function that can be overridden maybe? If it's a class, you could override it, but usually those are simple functions that, where is it? Those are simple functions I like to make them static or free functions. Input, output. Yeah. If I need something extra, we just create a new function. Yes. I don't Maybe. like using subclassing for reusing yeah. code. Composing. Good Composition is usually a better solution. Yes. So you could compose functions to kind of reuse logic rather than using inheritance. Yeah, we're talking about data here as well. So I don't see that as a good fit. Is there any specific use cases we should use combined in cases where we should not? You use it when it helps you, don't use it when it is not helping you. I find it very helpful for composing different parts of the application unifying like different streams into a single stream and I try to limit it to the you know the composition of the app otherwise you start using it everywhere and everything gets harder to test because to test things now you need to start creating subscriptions to this chains and observing what happens to the stream what kind of values are emitted when sometimes it's just simpler to just test calling a function and seeing what happens instead of creating subscriptions and dealing with cancelables and all of that so I usually use it in the infrastructure layer because it's quite handy. Like network requests. Is this going to be relevant to UIKit as well? Yes, it works with SwiftUI, UIKit, AppKit, whatever framework you're using. It works with all of them. What about cache mechanism? Well, we have caching, like URL cache built in, in URL session. You can define the size of the cache and it will handle pretty much most things, but you can also create your own cache with core data, with the file system, whatever makes sense to you. But this is outside the scope of an ATP client. If you need to cache something, it will be done somewhere else, not in the client. Yeah. Is there no difference between capturing self or concrete property enclosures? There are differences. Where was it? Here. For example, this is a variable. So when I capture the reference to the variable, I'm capturing the, the, the current state of that variable inside the closure. So if later we set a different value here, it's not gonna affect this value in the closure. But if I capture self, the time this is invoked, I get the current state of the property. 
since it's mutable, can be changed, the value may have changed. If you want to always use the latest value, then you capture self to get the latest value of the property of self. Otherwise, you get the value that was set at the time of the creation of the closure. That's one of the differences, right? Also, the difference is that if you capture just the property, you're not capturing a reference to self. So self is not retained inside the closure, which means self can be deallocated even though the closure still exists. So there are some differences. That's it. Bye, y'all. See ya. Mm -hmm.